Hello and welcome to part two of week 11. Uh, sorry I split this up into two videos. It's just it felt like you really needed a break and, and these topics kind of have a good stopping point. Anyways, let's jump right back into it. So now we're going to talk about tax incidents. So at first we talked about kind of, hey, what are taxes? Now we're going to talk about when we have taxes in a market, does it really matter which side we put it on? Do, should, we, should we give the tax to the consumers when they're checking out at the register? Should we give it to the producers while they're producing something? And that really depends, or at least that's that's kind of the answer we're getting down to. So we call this tax incidents. Who bears the burden of a tax? If I put a new tax into, let's say the, the book market, so we have taxes in the book market, oops, as I'm now dropping my books, does the tax, if I put it on the producer, does the tax get borne by the producer or does the producer go, ooh, that tax looks like it's gonna hurt. I'm gonna have to raise the price some and offset some of this to the consumer in the form of raised prices. Or, or what if we put it as a sales tax? If we have a really, really large sales tax on, on the consumers, well, then, then the producers are gonna be like, ooh, they're gonna have to pay that big sales tax. They're not, they're not gonna pay for our good and that sales tax. We better lower our price a little bit so that we can still maintain customers. Sometimes there's going to be adjustments one way or the other. So the, the perspective of how a tax affects people or affects the situation is actually very, very different. So let's think about this tax incidence. So tax incidence is just the division of burden of a tax between a buyer and sellers. Sometimes in perfectly inelastic systems, it might all be on one particular group. So all the burn of tax might go to the sellers or might go to the buyers. But most of the time, since we don't live in this world of perfectly inelastic supply or perfectly inelastic demand, a lot of the time we're somewhere in the middle where part of it will be offset by changes in prices so that we have part of the tax affecting both the, the buyers or the consumers and the sellers and producers. So when an item is taxed, its price might rise, but not always by the full amount of a tax, right? If I go to a producer of, I don't know, uh, remotes, if I go to a producer of remotes and I say, hey, you have a $1 tax in remotes, they'll be like, ah, okay. That doesn't mean that they're raising the price of their remote by a dollar, but maybe they might raise the price of their remote by 50 cents. So the people at the checkout pay about 50 cents and then they pay about 50 cents out of pocket, right? There's these adjustments on prices relative to this new cost, but it may not always go up by that same amount. If, if the market price raises by the full amount, then the buyers are paying the tax. If I'm saying, okay, I'll I'm getting taxed a dollar for these remotes, I'm raising the price by a dollar. Well, then, then the buyer takes the full amount of the tax. This happens in a case of perfectly inelastic supply, right? If the market price rises by less than the amount of tax, then the buyers and sellers end up sharing the tax. If it doesn't rise at all, then the sellers are just paying the tax out of pocket. That's the idea of, I know the people out there will only pay $15 for a remote. If they pay $15.01, they're gonna run screaming out of the store. So you're giving me this tax. I'm just gonna pay all the tax out of pocket because I cannot change the price of my remotes. It's that sort of idea. And we have a lot of the different extremes in between. So don't worry, don't worry. We're going to explain all of this. And we're gonna do this with a really simple example that, that we tend to use back in the principles courses just to get our brains flowing, right? So let's say that we're going to look at the equivalence of a tax on a buyer versus a seller. So let's say that this is Maryland because Maryland did put a $3 tax on their cigarettes. And let's say the state of Maryland, they really want to discourage people smoking, right? Well, they know they want to have a $3 tax, but they don't know who to put it on. Do they go to the cigarette companies and say, hey, you had to pay us $3 for each, each cigarette pack that's sold in the state? Or do they go to the consumers and say, that might be a $5 pack of cigarettes, but you're paying an extra $3 at the register so that the taxes are on the consumer side. Which one should they put it on? It turns out, doesn't really matter. So let's find out what, what, what we're going to see here. Let's say that we put this tax on the sellers. Okay, well, much like our difference in between marginal cost and marginal social cost, we see that the supply line uh, is shifted when we include a tax on the sellers. When we put a tax on the sellers, it moves this, this one curve inwards, 
right? Does the same thing for demand if we put it on to the buyers, but we'll talk about that one in a minute. So if we have this supply line that includes the tax on the sellers, we have now gone to this new point, right? So we have this original point right here, and now we move to this new point. Okay, all right, that's pretty cool. We kind of know what's going on here. Well, let's see a couple things that did happen. We see that there's now this triangle that's formed. We should know seeing this, that this is a deadweight loss. Okay, well, we're trying to encourage people to not smoke. So a deadweight loss is just representing consumer and producer surplus loss. That might actually be a good thing. So it's representing that some trades are no longer happening in the market. In fact, we see that we go down from 350 million packs of cigarettes sold to 325 million packs of cigarettes sold. Now, what we also see is that the, with, when we're looking at our supply and demand, the prices have gone up, right? So this original price was $6 for a pack of cigarettes. But now at this new equilibrium, it's $8 for a pack of cigarettes. Well, what does that really mean? Well, that means that this buyer is going to pay $8. But we know that there's a $3 tax that's taken out by or from the seller side, right? So though the price is $8, $3, the difference in between these two lines, because the, the difference in the physical difference in the lines is equivalent to the amount of the tax. So we have this $3 difference, right? Well, this $3 difference, that's $3 that goes to the government. So we actually have this rectangle that's formed right here. It's the height of $3 times the width of the amount of money or the amount the quantity of cigarettes sold, there we go. So it's 325 times three. So what, $975 million right here in this tax revenue in this rectangle. What we see is that we, yeah, buyers are paying $8, but $3 is going to the government. So only $5 is now going to these companies. So the seller gets $5, the buyer pays $8. So we put in this tax, right? And we see that the price actually went up, not by the full amount of the tax. The price went from $6 to $8. So two thirds of the burden of the tax kind of went to the buyers because, you know, there's this new higher price, right? That they're paying these higher prices. And then one third's kind of paid by the seller. It's the difference in between that price and the amount that they now get in their bank account after this new reality. So sellers end up losing out on a dollar per pack of cigarettes compared to their, their unregulated market. Buyers are now paying $2 more for cigarettes than they did in the unregulated market. This is the tax on sellers. Let's look for a similar one on buyers. All right, let's say that we have the same $3 tax and we put it on the buyer side. Well, that means that we're shifting it, the demand curve, down by $3. So that's why the difference in between this demand line and the demand line minus taxes is this difference is going to be $3. Notice we see a couple of very familiar parts here. We see, for one, that a triangle has been created. There is dead weight loss in the system because we're still going from 350 million packs of cigarettes sold to 325 million packs of cigarettes sold. But instead of going to the sellers and saying, ah, for each pack of cigarettes put on the shelves, you have to pay us, we're now going to the buyers and saying, ah, for each pack of cigarettes that you buy, there's going to be this extra tax at the register that you have to pay. So this extra $3 tax at the register, well, we know that we have our dead weight loss triangle, and then we have this $3. So $3 of the tax times the number of packs sold, which is 325 million. We know this is our $975 million rectangle of money to the government, right? That means that we have a reduction in our consumer surplus up here. We have a reduction in our producer surplus, but let's see what's happening to prices. So that means let's look at our original equilibrium. It's $6 for a pack of cigarettes. In our new equilibrium for our new demand curve, we see that this amount is $5. So, okay. All right. That means $5 goes to the seller. The seller gets to keep $5. They had to lower their price. Now let's go up and see what the buyer actually pays because they pay the $5 for the pack of cigarettes plus this $3 tax. So they're really paying $8 at the register. So whether it's the prices go up and then the seller has to pay the government or um, the prices go down and then you get this big tax at the register that you have to pay to the government. Either way, either way, whether you put this on the seller or the buyer, the buyer now pays $8, the seller now gets $5. That is not 
not the same as the six dollars in the unregulated market. So what what have we learned here? We learned here the first the first cool rule of tax incidents, and the first rule is that it doesn't really the the statutory burden of a tax does not describe who really bears the tax. I'm gonna tell you what a statutory burden is in a minute. Don't worry. The second piece is that the side of the market in which the tax is imposed is irrelevant. It doesn't matter because prices are going to adjust and the burden will end up being shared the same whether you put the tax on the buyer or the seller. Third, parties of inelastic supply or demand bear the taxes. So we're going to go into why that is, but basically if you're still willing to buy this good, whether it costs $10 or $100, then they're going to just raise the price a lot on you right? If you're a seller and you have to sell this item, whether they're willing to pay you $10 or $100, well, then you're going to have to be the one who pays a lot of the tax, right? You're the less flexible person and the one less likely to walk away in a situation. So let's talk a little bit about each of these rules in turn. So rule number one, rule number one is that the statutory burden of a tax does not describe who really bears the tax. Statutory burden is just kind of the idea of statutory incidence. It's the burden of a tax borne by the party that sends the check to the government. If the buyers send the check to the government, well, they're still kind of paying $8 at the register, right? If the sellers send the, the check to the government, the buyers are still paying $8. The sellers still get $5 in their bank account. If it's on, if it's on the buyers, the sellers still get five dollars in their bank account. It doesn't really matter who sends the check. What matters is their relationship to each other and how much prices adjust, which that's going to be determined by the slope of our demand and supply curves. So we also have this idea of economic incidence. Economic incidence is the burden of taxation as measured by changes in the resources that are available to economic agents. Economic incidents just kind of includes things like tax payments and prices that are changed because of the idea of a tax, right? So there's going to be an economic incident. We're going to put in a tax on someone and there's going to be shifts and flows. And maybe it might affect the buyers and the sellers. And this incidence is determined by the system, how supply and demand look, how they relate with one another, and not necessarily by who we say needs to pay it. So that means that taxes kind of act like a wedge. Well, what do I mean by that? We have our demand curve, we have our supply curve. If we put in a tax, well, this tax is going to be equivalent to the difference in between the demand and supply curve. It's literally just kind of putting a wedge into our system and shifting it to the left. Let's go back to these other ones. We put in a tax so that this difference in between our demand curve and our supply curve, we move leftwards, from our unregulated market to the point where these differences were equal to the amount of the tax. That just means that we are making the bigger and bigger the tax, the bigger this dead weight loss triangle gets and the bigger this rectangle gets, right? And until eventually you're right up against here and it actually becomes smaller again. There's this whole idea of finding the optimal taxation. I'm not gonna make you do that math because that would be cruel of me, but there, there's more there. Anyway, so it acts as a wedge and this wedge ends up creating a triangle of deadweight loss and a rectangle of tax revenue to the government, right? So, yep. Rule number two, rule number two. This is the one that we kind of just looked at in the previous example, right? It didn't matter if I put the taxes on the buyer or on the seller. It's irrelevant because prices are going to adjust. And they're going to adjust similarly so that the buyer is going to pay one amount and the seller is going to get one amount into their bank account. Whether you put it on the buyer or the seller, it's going to come out to the same, same realization. Either it's on the buyer and seller is going to have to drop price to keep the people buying them, even though that they're having to pay this tax on top of the price. Or, or you put it on the sellers and the sellers have to raise their price and they still get less money in their bank account at the end of the day. It doesn't matter which side of the market that you put the tax on, which is super duper duper cool. All right, the third one. Parties with inelastic supply or demand bear the tax. If you are the less flexible person, you are more likely going to take that tax, right? If I have to buy pens, I have to buy pens. Then they know that they can raise the price on me, right? So if, if a new tax comes in, they might say, you know what? 
we're not going to lower our price. Or you know what? We're going to raise our prices because we know that she's going to be willing to pay it. What if instead, I didn't care about pins. This is a terrible brand of pin. Like I'm only buying it because it's cheap and I will switch to anything else if the price goes up. In that case, I'm fairly elastic. I'm very willing to walk away relative to a price change. If I'm willing to walk away relative to a price change, then they're not going to change the price. They'll just say, you know what, I'm going to have to pay this tax out of my pocket because if I raise the price, we're losing our customers. That's kind of what we mean about this. All right. So the economic incidence of this taxation doesn't really depend on, on who we say has to pay the tax. It depends on what the market looks like. So it's ultimately determined by the elasticity of supply and demand. If you're unfamiliar with elasticity, or maybe it's been a while since you've studied elasticity, please let me know. I can send you the 112 lectures on elasticity just so you can look at them and get like a refresher real fast into what elasticity looks like, right? But it was like chapter four back in your principles of micro class. All right, so if one side of the market is perfectly inelastic, then it's going to take the full tax, right? That just means that there's a full shift um, if I know, no matter what, you're perfectly inelastic, you're going to pay whatever price there is for this pin, then I'm putting the whole tax on you. I am raising the price by the amount of that tax. If I know that you are going to sell this to me, no matter what the price is, because you have to, then I'm going to make sure that you adjust your prices relative to that tax because I'm not paying anymore. The idea of full shift is our perfectly inelastic and or perfectly inelastic supply or demand situation where then, then we can say that the entire tax is borne by one person, but it's not always necessarily the case. So there's a lot of information about taxes and efficiency and I'm not going to talk your ear off the whole night about it, but except in extreme cases of perfectly inelastic demand or perfectly inelastic supply, when the quantity remains the same, imposing a tax creates an inefficiency. So putting in a tax is putting a purposeful inefficiency into a system. The really cool and interesting part is that we are purposely putting an inefficiency into the system a lot of the time to try to correct for a different inefficiency. We have pollution, which is bad and a market failure. So we're going to put in a tax, which is a different type of market failure to try to offset that and maybe go in the other direction. It's so neat how things like that happen. So let's think about the inefficiency on like, the, I don't know, the, the tax on tablet computers. Let's say there's a $200 tax on, on tablet computers. Ooh, did I put in the, I put in the wrong graph. Ignore that. We are not talking about a tax on tablet consumers. Let's talk about a tax on per gallon prices of, of gasoline, I guess, right? So we have gasoline and let's say that in an unregulated market whatsoever, it'd be a dollar fifty for gasoline. Then, then the government comes in and they say, you know what, suppliers, we're gonna, we're gonna need you to pay a tax. We're gonna need you to pay 50 cents for every gallon that you sell this person. Well, maybe I have to drive no matter what, right? And they know that I have to drive no matter what. I have a very inelastic demand. I have to, I don't know, I have to get across country for a wedding or I am maybe owning a trucking company, something like that. No matter what, there has to be gas in my tank, no matter how much it costs. If I have a perfectly inelastic demand, then that means if the supplier now has to pay this 50 cent tax, what do they do? They just raise the price by 50 cents. They know that I'm willing to pay all of it because I'm perfectly inelastic. Let's think about the other case. What if I'm perfectly elastic? What if I am only, only willing to pay $1.50 for gas? You charge me $1.51, I'm selling my car and I'm never driving again, right? So the perfectly elastic version of this, of like, I am just so price sensitive that you change the price at all. You raise it at all, I'm gone. Well, then if we put in a 50 cent tax, if we shift the supply curve up by a 50 cent tax, well, what's going to happen in this situation? Well, what we see is that the price, this interaction is still going to stay at $1.50. But that's not necessarily what the seller gets. The seller is going to keep a dollar. They're going to have to pay 50 cents directly to the government because they know they can't change the price. So they're going to have to pay the full 50 cents themselves. Notice in this situation that we have this triangle created because now there is a deadweight loss. That deadweight loss is going to represent firms that may no longer sell gasoline because they can't afford to pay 50 cents out of their pocket. This deadweight loss did not exist when we have this perfectly inelastic demand. There's no triangle that's created by just shifting up and down along a straight inelastic demand curve. 
curve. But there is one that's created when we have an elastic demand curve. Okay, then the the amount of tax or the burden of tax is also very determined by the steepness. So the closer to the perfectly inelastic case that you have of your particular type of good or service. So in this one, we have two similar demand curves. Let's say that we have just our normal average demand curve and we're trying to put in a tax, right? We're putting in a tax for, I don't know, uh, steel producers or sidewalk vendors, doesn't matter, we're putting in a tax. So steel producers, that's a pretty inelastic group, right? They, they, they already have the steel pouring. It's been on, it's been on order for months. Like they, no matter how much you really change the price or, or how much you tax, they're still going to have to pay it. So when we shift up by maybe the amount of the tax, it doesn't necessarily move very far uh, on, on a horizontal plane. It instead moves high on a vertical plane, right? So when we add in this tax, what we see is that the deadweight loss that we're creating is actually a relatively small triangle, right? Where the producer is going to have a larger part of that deadweight loss triangle. Back to, if you do not remember deadweight loss from your original Econ 112, let me know. I'll send you the lecture. I'm just not reteaching Econ 112 material. But if you need it, I'll give you a link to it. So just let me know. Okay, but in this one we see not much deadweight loss, majority of it goes to producer. What if, what if, this is sidewalk vendors. Sidewalk vendors, they're, they're not like steel companies. They can just say, you know what, no. Um, you're taxing me? I don't think so. And like, I can just leave or I can produce something else? Like, no, thank you, right? So maybe they're more elastic. Maybe they're more willing to walk away over a price change. Well, what happens in this situation? If we do decide to tax them, we see that we have a reduction in quantity. A reduction in quantity is a little bit bigger. We have a price change. The price change is a little bit bigger. But notice our deadweight loss triangle. We still have this deadweight loss triangle, but notice that the top half of the triangle, the loss to consumer surplus, is actually much larger in that situation. And that's because consumers end up taking the brunt of the tax. They're closer to inelastic in this case, while in the other case, it was the suppliers. So, we have this idea of balanced budget tax incidents as well. Tax incident analysis typically only accounts for who's paying the tax, right? But when we're thinking about balanced budgets, tax incident analysis is where we need to account for both the tax, what we're taxing, and the benefit it brings. Okay, we tax um, gasoline. Well, we think, okay, who's, who's, bearing, who's bearing the burden of this gasoline tax? What we're not necessarily adding into that is how much reduction and damage to these cars is happening because we're fixing the roads. How much good is happening because there's now enough funding for roads that we were able to make like a, another bridge over to St. Louis and reduce traffic. We need to think about the balanced budget perspective of both what, when we're thinking about incidents, both the tax and any benefits from the tax. But it's very, very difficult to be able to measure because it's hard to know exactly what the benefits for each tax increase is. In this, we have the idea of partial equilibrium and general equilibrium. So this is probably a term that you'll hear in your econometrics course. It's the idea of partial changes or general equilibrium changes. So we've considered the incidents in only one market. We've looked at only steel companies, only cigarettes, only, only whatever, but we're not necessarily thinking about what happens in all the market, right? So, if we have a partial equilibrium tax instance, we're only considering the impact of the tax on one market. So let's do gasoline tax. Okay, gasoline tax. We put in the gasoline tax, slightly less people driving, prices are more expensive. Okay. General equilibrium is considering all the markets, right? So we put in this gasoline tax, prices go up, few less people drive, there's less degradation to the roads, there's less fatalities and homicide by vehicular manslaughter, there's um, less road degradation, there's less money kind of raised by the source though because less people are driving, there's other things happening in other markets. Maybe because we have this gasoline tax and less people drive, then there's less demand for tires or, or other things like that, right? Taxes in one market rarely, rarely if ever uh, affect only that market. It ends up affecting all prices in a bunch of other markets through a very, very complicated system 
of analysis. So I just kind of needed you to know the idea of this general versus partial equilibrium. With that, I'll see you in class. Remember that your rough drafts are due to me by the 11th. Okay, everybody have a great one. I'll see you later. Bye.